It's Ken Harbaugh with Against All Enemies on the Midas Touch Network. Senator Tommy Tuberville continues to block promotions for senior military officers. We've talked about this before and the real harm being done to our national security by the actions of a single selfish politician. The Senate is doing what it can to navigate around these holds, and it just overwhelmingly confirmed General Charles Brown to be the next chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Earlier today, the Senate voted to officially confirm the next chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In an 83 to 11 vote, Air Force General Charles Brown was confirmed to the seat, despite a seven-month blockade by GOP Senator Tommy Tuberville. Brown is set to replace outgoing Chairman Mark Milley, whose term ends on October 15th. But Senator Tuberville, true to form, was one of a handful of senators to vote no. That was probably to be expected. What shocked even me is how open Tuberville has become with his race-baiting rhetoric. I've got Amanda Weinstein back to talk about this. She's an Air Force Academy grad with a Ph.D. But first, here is Tommy Tuberville justifying in the most cynical way his vote against General Brown. I think he's got some woke policies. I I like CQ. I've had him in my office several times back when he was chief of the Air Force. Uh, But you voted against him. He's He's a good person. He believes in what he's doing. We all have, you have to believe in what you're doing. Uh, now, he, he doesn't have really have any authority other than giving advice to the president. He, he's, he's a general, but he's not really over the Army, Air Force, Navy. Uh, he has to, to just give uh, information and advice to the president. Uh, I think he'll do a good job, but I heard him say a few things that, that really didn't fit with me in terms of making our military better and better. You got to remember, you know, we have a free what country. What was it, though, specifically, Senator? Well, we have a free country. We have things that, that we need to do to make sure that, that, that we can uphold. And we can't do that without a great, hard, strong military. Now, uh, I heard mm-hmm. some things that he talked about, about race and things that he wanted to mix into the military. Let me tell you something. Our military is not an equal opportunity employer. We're looking for the best of best to do whatever. We're not lo- looking for... Uh, uh, different groups, social justice groups. We don't want to single-handedly destroy our military from within. We all need to be one. It's like a football team I coach. You can't have different groups. Everybody's got to be together to win. There's no second place in war. And so uh, I listened to all of these generals and admirals, and, and we have some great ones. We have some great military people, but there's some in there that have a different agenda to make sure that they get their quotas in. And we're not a quota. Uh, yeah. This is a military that. But when so you say race, problems. Senator, that that's that. Can can you tell us what you mean by? Are you talking about enhancing diversity at the Pentagon? What is it about race that bothers you about the new chairman of the Joint Chiefs? Well, he, he came out and said we need we need certain groups, um, more pilots, certain groups to to have an opportunity to be pilots. Listen, uh, I want it to be on merit. I want our military to be the best. I want the best people. I don't care who they are. Men, women, it doesn't make any difference. Catholics, uh, Protestants. I, I want everybody to believe in the one goal that we have in this country for our military is to protect the taxpayers, to protect the United States of America. Don't give me this stuff about equal opportunity because that's not what this military is about. Amanda, great to have you back. I cannot believe we are once again talking about Senator Tuberville. We ran the clip at the top of the show for everyone to to watch and listen to. But can you give us the quick backstory? I think we're tired of it by now. But why does the senator claim he is putting these holds on these promotions? Oh, I mean, there's a lot of claims on the holds on the promotions. Apparently, he is very offended that the military would dare to provide women with the health care they need and the reproductive access. So he is going to put a hold on whoever is going forward. And unfortunately, that this time was just General Charles Brown that he is going to put a hold and be one of the few senators uh, not to actually vote to confirm him. What do the two issues have to do with each other? It seems like political blackmail. I mean, on one hand, you have a military that is in desperate need of leadership for the first time in living memory. The Marine Corps didn't have a commandant because of Senator Tuberville. You have dozens, if not hundreds of promotions now being held up in the most senior roles, the most important roles in the military. And somehow that's being connected to the military covering travel for women needing health care. 
Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure the top line of the Republican playbook is uh, definitely political blackmail. So we see that here with the military. We see it with a government shutdown. Like first line of the playbook is how do you create chaos and politically blackmail everyone to try and get things that you want that are politically unpopular with most of the nation? Senator Murphy had this jaw dropping tweet responding to an interview Tuberville, the one we just showed, gave to to Bloomberg. He said the way Senator Tuberville talks so openly about white supremacy is just jaw dropping. I refuse to allow this to feel normal. <laughs> the problem is it's becoming normal, at least from Senator Tuberville, I would argue from the, the Republican Party writ large. It is completely normalized. I mean, he starts off by saying things they are just factually untrue uh, by saying things like, you know, the military is not an equal opportunity employer. Actually, it is. <laughs> It actually is that, sir. And the Pentagon actually has an office making sure that is an equal opportunity employer. And why does it have that? Well, you and I both know that every military member raises their right hand. And what do they swear to do to defend the Constitution? Part of that Constitution is the 14th Amendment, guaranteeing people the right to employment without facing discrimination based on race. We are not only an equal opportunity employer in the military, but we are also protecting that right for everybody else out there. And why are we doing that? Well, for a lot of reasons, but research shows that if we want to stay the most lethal force in the entire world, then we need to make sure we're doing things like having a diverse fighting force because research shows it is better at problem solving, better at decision making, better at innovation, creativity, resilience, adaptability, broader skill sets. This is how we get the most lethal force in the world is by having a diverse fighting force. There are two sides of this, though. I absolutely agree with you that a more diverse force is a more innovative, creative, more lethal force. But there's also the moral element, the idea that our military should look like the society it defends. I Somebody shared with me a confidential report, I, I won't share the author of it, that the Marine Corps um, commissioned, not classified, just, you know, not for distribution. I'm not breaking any rules here. But one of the things that really- You don't have it in your bathroom out, somewhere, all the classified no, no, reports. It's, it's, <laughs> I, I, I do not. Um, one of the things that jumped out at me, this was not very long ago. This was just a couple of years ago at a time when the Marine Corps had literally three black tactical aviators. That's three black fighter pilots in the entire Marine Corps. And the commandant uh, said, we need to address this problem, reached out to someone I know who helped author the report. But it was this quote that really stuck with me. The lifeblood of the Corps is the individual Marine. We cannot have a Corps that does not look like America. Can you explain why that is so important? And then we'll get to why Senator Tuberville just doesn't get it. Yeah, I mean, when we think fundamentally what the entire Department of Defense is doing, what the military is doing, they're defending our nation and our nation is made up of people. Our nation is the people that are within its borders. They are the people that are here. This is who we are protecting. And it is important to be representative of those people for moral reasons that that you explained. But we also need to realize that when we're thinking about his statements and the immorality of his statements, he is also assuming a whole lot of things in that statement. He is assuming that a diverse military is somehow not one that's based on merit. He is assuming that a diverse military is somehow not the most lethal force in the nation which is absurd and baked in bias and all of the things that we're describing completely immoral that why and like when do we stop to question that why would he assume that it's not based on merit just because it's diverse that is a ridiculous assumption baked in bias he just doesn't see the biased waters he's swimming in every day Thanks for listening, everyone. I've got a quick break here, but I need a favor first. Shows like this depend on your support. Please, if you can spare five seconds, click the link to the podcast version of the show below and leave us a five-star review. It really does help. Thanks. That 
merit argument has been a canard for racist policies for generations. I'm thinking about the way the Tuskegee Airmen were were treated, the fact that the the military as an institution said that they could not possibly learn to fly. Excuses like uh, black people can't see in color, things like that. And they reshaped this merit argument to exclude Americans who wanted to serve their country. I see echoes of that in Senator Tuberville's comments. Absolutely. We see it based on race, based on gender, based on anything they want to pick out. They will always come and say, well, it must be merit. And the truth is the data just doesn't hold up. It's just simply not true. We see with the Tuskegee Airmen and we see over and over in the military that it doesn't work, that we see that when you have diverse people in there, that you do have that stronger force. We do have a more lethal force that's more capable because of the diversity. He doesn't realize that the diversity is not our weakness. The diversity in the military is actually our strength. And I remember going into the military when you are thrown in basic training, I'm sure the same with you, you are thrown in there with people, uh, different genders all over the country, different races, different religions, and you have to figure out real fast if you want to make it through, you're going to figure out how to work together. Otherwise, one of you might not make it through. And that is something that gets drilled into you instantly, which is something that I have a lot of pride in the military for figuring out how to do, that it seems like the rest of our country can't quite get there. Do you think the Republican Party is beginning to lose its claim of being the national security party? When I hear Senator Tuberville say, I am the most military person there is. That's a quote. He said it half a dozen times. He said it from the Senate floor, having never served himself. I want to believe that that most Americans and, and hopefully all veterans see that and find it ridiculous. Quick editorial note here for our podcast listeners who can't see the visual. This is a clip of Senator Mark Kelly taking Tuberville to task for claiming to be, quote, the most military person there is. I think it's important to point out and comment on what Senator Tuberville just said. I think the quote was, there's nobody more military than me. Nobody more military up here than me, but... Uh, uh, as far as I could tell, there's at least four of us maybe more that served in the United States military, in some cases for decades, and at least three combat veterans. So I take great exception to what Senator Tuberville had to say. And I've heard him say it before, and it just doesn't make any sense. So I did an analysis of the last presidential election, and one of the voting blocks that saw the largest swings was actually veterans, which I think is interesting. And I think when you look at that swing, and I think it was a swing that was underestimated by a lot of people because there's still, it doesn't say they all swung, but a lot of them swung. But the swung was the swing was large enough that it really says something substantial about how veterans and the military are viewing what happened in the previous administration and also the general direction of the Republican Party, that they do not have the defense of this nation and what's best for the defense of nation, top of mind, the exact opposite. So in chaos and extremism puts our nation at risk. And I think veterans know that, which is why you see them swinging away from the GOP. That swing is all the more remarkable, especially in 2020, that presidential year, given that an incumbent Republican wartime president, Donald Trump, lost military votes. That has never happened. The military, by and large, rallies around the flag, especially during wartime. But more than at almost any point I can think of in history, they saw through the the phoniness, the bluster of Donald Trump as commander in chief and began to shift towards the Democratic Party. Absolutely. I think you saw a number of decisions he made that put our nation at risk. I think you saw him make terrible statements about John McCain, a war hero. I think they saw enough of his actions 
that anything that he claimed to be, if he claimed to be the most military person out there, that claim wasn't going to hold water because they had already seen enough of what he had done for this country and what he had done in terms of defense for this country. It's just not going to hold water anymore when their actions do not back up any statement of, well, I'm the most pro-military person, right? I don't want to see a support the troops ribbon on the back of your car when you're doing things like making statements that are inherently dangerous and really harm the lethality of our nation's Department of Defense by saying these outlandish claims like we shouldn't have an equal opportunity defense. When Senator Tuberville says that, the reaction I hear most often is he's ignorant, he doesn't understand the military. He's in way over his head. Uh, I'm going to restate the quote just so we have it at top of mind. I heard some things he talked about referring to uh, Charles Brown, the nominee for CJCS. Uh, I heard some, heard some things he talked about about race and things that he wanted to mix into the military. And I wouldn't say he gets a pass when people call him stupid for saying things like that. But there's perhaps another explanation, and it's the most uncomfortable one, which is that his audience loves it, that the base Republican voter in Alabama hears that as a dog whistle, and it's not set out of ignorance, it's set out of racism. So one of the most frustrating things I see from politicians are for, you know, I don't know him, but from ones I do know, when I see them making statements I know they don't believe, just to get votes and to get clicks and to get in the media and in the news cycle, right? This is not saying anything that's helpful, right? He is not saying anything that is helpful to the military, that is helpful to the Department of Defense, that is helpful for the defense of our nation, that is helpful to protect our constitution. None of that is in any way helpful. What it is only helpful for is getting his base riled up about something that isn't true. And I know we've talked about snake oils salesman, but basically it's snake oil sales. He's trying to sell them something that flat out is not true. Love your analysis. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, who have you got lined up on the Suburban Women Problem podcast? Oh, actually, some of my favorites that we just got to talk to is occasionally we talk to troublemakers, which are people that are everyday women in their neighborhoods, in their communities, stirring up trouble, making sure that we are getting out there and doing the work. And those are always my favorites. Great. Well, add a link. Uh, I think most of your shows or are, are, are a lot of them are going to be on this same network, the Midas Touch Network, right? That's right. Awesome. Great. Well, put a link in. Thanks for joining us, Amanda. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate it.